Welcome to the Krzyzewska Foundation webinar, Maria skłodowska kiri a pioneer for women in science discussing the life, body of work, and legacy of Poland's greatest scientist. My name is Marek Skulimowski. I'm the president of the Krzyzewska Foundation, and it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce our esteemed speakers who agreed to take part in our today's program. These are Susan Quinn, an award-winning author of biography, Marie Curie, Alive, the book which was translated into nine languages and, and was a Los Angeles Time Book Prize finalist. And it was designed as one of the best science tech books of 1995 by Library Journal and was awarded the Grand Prix d'Electrice by Ellie Magazine. Ms. Quinn has also been contributing author for The Atlantic, The New York Times Magazine and The Boston Globe Magazine. Professor Mar Maria Shemyonov, a world-renowned scientist, microsurgeon. In 2008, Professor Shemyonov led a team of surgeons that performed the first near total face transplant in the US at the Cleveland Clinic, which was one of the most complicated operations of its type to date. Professor Shemyonov served as director of plastic surgery research and had of microsurgical training for Cleveland Clinic's Department of Plastic Surgery. She currently serves as professor and director, director of microsurgery research at University of Illinois. Professor Keiko Kawashima is a professor of Nagoya Institute of Technology, Japan. She is an executive committee member of the Japanese Society for the 18th Century Studies a member of several history of science societies in Japan and the Gender History Association of Japan. Her first publications were, were devoted to the relation between gender and science, especially in 18th century France. Among her most recent research projects are female scientists in Japan inspired by Maria Skłodowska Curie. The discussion will be moderated by Nobel Prize winning chemists Frank H. T. Rhodes, Professor of Human Letters at Cornell University, Professor Roald Hoffman. Professor Hoffman is not only a renowned scientist, but also an accomplished writer and an avid promoter of science and art. He took part in, tele in the television course titled The World of Chemistry, shown widely since 1990. In his many essays and three books, he connected the words of science, poetry, and philosophy. He has also run a monthly cabaret at the Cornelia Street Cafe in Greenwich Village in New York titled Entertaining Science. Professor Hoffman was born in Slotchów in pre-war Poland, and he's a member of the Kościuszko Foundation Collegium of Eminent Scientists, and as of two weeks, also an honorary trustee of the Kościuszko Foundation. Congratulations. And my sincere thanks go to Dr. Hanna Hrobocze Kelker. It was her initial idea, idea to organize this webinar about Maria Skłodowska Kiri. This webinar is being live streamed, streamed and recorded and will be posted on the Kościuszko Foundation's YouTube channel. Professor Hoffman, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. Um, I want to take the opportunity to welcome all of you to this evening. I also hope that you will take the opportunity, or you have, to take a look at the Kosciuszko Foundation website uh, and at the work of this remarkable organization which brings uh, Poland and America together in a number of ways. Marie Curie was born actually uh, on November 7th, not too long ago, uh, 153 years ago, uh, and she died in 1934, 86 years ago. All of us have come in contact with Marie Curie in different ways. Let me tell you about my indirect contact. I was a 10 years old in 1947. We were in a refugee displaced persons camp in Germany at the time. 
uh, the American occupation forces, in their wisdom uh, to instruct the Germans in democracy, um, translated some books they thought would be good for the process as school books for children taught in Germany. And two of them came my way in German. One was a German translation from the French of uh, the remarkable biography by her daughter Eve uh, of Marie Curie. And the other book was, it just happened, a biography of a black agricultural chemist, George Washington Carver. And those two books were my introduction to science. It was very easy to find sympathy, to find a connection to Manya uh, Skodowska becoming Marie Curie. Uh, it was a little harder to do something with George Washington Carver, uh, in part because peanuts and sweet potatoes with which he worked were not part of my experience. I had never seen one of those in, in Europe. But I came to both of those. And as I read Marie Curie's story, uh, I could not be help but be caught by it. And so it has happened to every one of us. We go into that room where Pierre and Marie Curie in Eve's Lives of the Saints telling of this story. Uh, we go in and we watch the glow of the light and as they have finished extracting uh, some radium from a ton of pitch blend, and we cannot help but be there. And Eve paints that picture. Times have changed, and that is in part why we are together here. Times have changed, but have they? And that's a question which we would like to discuss with you in various ways. Um, maybe the romance has gone off the radium. Though it just happens that I just saw an application of radium in a medical, a new application of radium in a medical setting that I could tell you about by, as it happens, a Cornell colleague of mine. Um, things have changed in other ways, but they also haven't changed. So uh, I'll, I'll give you one statistic which, will, which, which set me off, uh, and that is I, I happen to have uh, been asked to join the Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, PAN. And so I look in the membership to see who of my friends are there. And of the 80 members, current members of the section where I am in, the chemistry and physics section of the Polish Academy of Sciences, of the regular members, among those 80 members, there is not one woman. That is a frightful statistic. Of course, it's, it's what I would have expected in another time and place of Germany and Japan. It's not what I would have expected of Poland. I, this is not to complain about Poland. Poland has done so well in a number of other ways, but it tells us something about what has changed and what hasn't changed. I can't help but cry still when I reread Eve Curie's story uh, because it really tugs at the emotions. And I would like us today to remember the memory of this great chemist, both Polish and French, and uh, a world scientist in a number of ways. And I would like us to uh, think about how things have changed. So in order to do this, uh, we've assembled three people who know much more about Marie Curie than I do. Uh, and uh, I hope that you will find the, the, what they have to say interesting. Uh, first, let's hear from Susan Quinn. Susan. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Uh, Dr. Hoffman and I shared a panel quite a few years ago at Rockefeller University, and uh, that happened to be a really momentous evening for me. 
for a couple of reasons. One of them was that another person on the panel was the late Oliver Sacks, um, uh, whom I admire so much, as many, many of us do. And he talked about his love of chemicals and of chemistry and about his uncle Tungsten, about whom he wrote a book. So that made the evening special to begin with, but the momentousness had to do with the fact that Eve Curie was in the audience. She was in her 90s by then. She lived to be uh, 100 and, 103, 103. Um, so, but that she was in her 90s at that time. And I was absolutely panicked because I was planning to talk about an aspect of Marie Curie's life that she had not written about. Uh, and I wasn't sure what her reaction would be. Um, so when I started on this project, one of my first visits was to Eve Curie. Um, she had an elegant apartment at that time on Sutton Place. And I went there to speak with her and to tell her that I was thinking of writing another biography to which her response was, why do you need to do that? Um, because I've written this biography already. Um, and my, I'm not sure exactly what I said, but something about the fact that that was 50 years ago and I thought there was a new attitudes about women and, and so on, I, I don't remember that part. What I do remember is that I asked her, I said, you know, Marie Curie died in 1934 and your book was published in 1937. You must have written that book very, you did read that, write that book very, very quickly. Um, and uh, was there a reason for that? To which she replied, um, I was afraid that someone else would do it before me and get it wrong. And that was my clue to what I'd already really believed, which was that there was another version of the story, uh, which she hadn't told, a, a more complicated and probably painful in some ways version. And um, she had written a biography of a daughter, a daughter's biography. And um, it's enormously sympathetic and charming as Dr. Hoffman said, um, but she had particular reasons for writing it. And in her book, she wrote only this, a vague kind of reference to some troubles that Marie Curie may have had, she described it as a perfidious campaign against this woman of 44, fragile, worn out by crushing toil, alone and without defense. That was all that was said. But what was this perfidious campaign? Uh, so that was one of the reasons I wanted to write another biography, and I did over the next 10 years. Um, and what I discovered during those 10 years was that there was a much more complicated and painful story to tell. Uh, Marie Curie was born, as Dr. Hoffman said, in 1867. And now I'm gonna talk a little about the life um, and I'm going to leave the science to the scientists on the panel. So I'm gonna talk about her life in general. Uh, born in 1867, she was the youngest of five children born to Bronisław and Władysław Skłodowski in Warsaw. There were four girls and one boy, and they were born into a impoverished nobility. They, they came from a landed gentry that had really suffered tremendously during the 19th century because of the uh, brutal Russian um, repression of of, 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 of Polish nation. So these, these people uh, in, in uh, Maria's family had participated in these uprisings and suffered from them. He had a grandfather who had been exiled to Siberia, in fact, and had walked all the way back to Warsaw on foot. So she, she was born, and we're talking a little bit tonight about the fact that this is also the 100th anniversary of women's uh, getting the vote and how, was, how did Maria Skodowska's life fit into um, uh, sort of the question of women in politics. And she was born into a really political world and her parents were deeply connected to the Polish cause. They were Polish patriots. 
uh, who had had these cir their circumstances really diminished by the oppressive regime of the czars. Uh, her mother taught um, in a school where Polish was spoken secretly. And when the Russian inspectors came, everybody switched to, po to Russian. Um, and Maria, because she was very bright, was often called on when the Russian inspector came to go to the board and present in Russian. Um, and she remembers that as being, as wanting to run away and hide. But she also wrote uh, in an early memory that um, she wanted to raise her little arms as a cat its paws and scratch. So she was a, a, a person who felt things strongly and who had a lot of deep indignation about the wrongs of the world from, from early childhood. Um, at her home, there was a tragedy unfolding. Her mother had contracted TB. And when Maria was about eight, I think, or nine, uh, was, the mother went off with the oldest sister, uh, Zosha, to the countryside where she was ex hopefully going to um, recover. She went to the south of France. Um, and I think to Germany at one point to spas and nothing worked. So finally she came back to Poland to Warsaw to the family. And by that time, because the father had lost several jobs because he didn't conform very well to the Russian regime, they had uh, a lot of students boarding in their house. It was quite crowded with students and um, uh, who were also in the school. And so as a result, typhus developed. And um, a lot of the children got sick, including the oldest sister, Dosha, and she died. And then within a few year, uh, months, actually, I think of that, um, Maria's mother died. So Maria lost her mother at 10, and it was a deep loss for her. And she, others in the family described her as being the one who was the most affected by it, um, very, but sort of sitting in a corner and uh, kind of immobilized, very, very sad. Um, but she also got the message some, from her mother, a strong message to be a good student. And she was a superb student. And that was, um, that was, her, that was her coping mechanism, I suppose we'd say now. Um, nothing could replace her mother, but the, the, her father was a very loving man in his own way and uh, passionate about, Polish language. He would scold the children if they spoke Polish incorrectly and passionate about the Polish poets, the patriotic poets of Poland and Maria and the other children remember um, sitting around and listening to him read aloud the poetry of Poland. Um, and he was also a, posit a positivist. Um, and that was a, a, a philosophy that one followed the science. Sound familiar? Um, and uh, he believed in following the science. He believed in rational solutions to things. And later, when Marie would rely, Marie would rely on this view when she was faced by very irrational hatred in, um, in France. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So there was no university in, Russia, in, uh, in Poland for women. Nowhere they could go, but they could go. They could go to Russia or they could go to Paris. Those were the choices. Um, and and both Maria and Bronya were very ambitious and very bright, and they they wanted this for their education. Joseph, the only son, was able to go to university in Poland, but the girls couldn't. Uh, so uh, after a time of some really awful jobs, being a kind of babysitter for people, Marie and Bronya struck up a an agreement that one of them would go to Paris, the other one go to, would go to work as a governess and support the first. And then after a couple of years, the second one would come. And that's what they did, amazingly. And uh, Bronya was older, so she went first. And Maria took a job in a kind of little town, kind of backwoods town um, with a family who um, had uh, farm or farm or sort of also kind of um, impoverished gentry. I actually went and visited this house in a place called Chuki. Um, and it was, it's now, it, of course, by the time I went there was, was post 
was post change, but but it was a, a collective farm that raised uh, sugar beets. There were piles of sugar beets in the field. And the house was very run down. I had this fantasy, still do, that someone should make it into a museum. Anyway, she went to this house of the Zavorsky, and she worked for them as a governess. And uh, she also, on the side, again, quite you know, a political thing to do, she organized a little school for local peasants. And that was, that was a very dangerous thing to do because what she was doing was teaching them to read. Um, and uh, that was, you know, that, that was trouble, <laughs> as we know. Um, so, uh, um, so she did that for two years. And finally, and it was, it was a very difficult time for her because she actually uh, fell in love with the oldest boy in the family who was, looks from photographs to be quite handsome and charming and all of that. And it's, it's hard to know what happened, but something bad happened. I think the family decided she wasn't good enough for him. I think that's what happened. Um, and she stayed on at that house after that, which must have been really miserable. So finally, after two years, Bronya said, meanwhile, she'd been sending money to Bronya in, in France through all this. Um, Bronya said, come, and she went to Paris. And uh, that was kind of like going to heaven for her. Uh, she was a wonderful student right away and, uh, you know, at the top of her classes, but loving them very much. At first, she lived with Bronya and her husband. Her husband was a Polish patriot revolutionary, really. Um, who couldn't even go back to Poland. Um, uh, and he, they, they had a very social house with people in it all the time. And Maria couldn't study, you know, enough. And that's all she wanted. So she moved to a six floor, tiny little apartment um, in one of those houses uh, near the Sorbonne. I, she lived in several like this. Um, it was freezing cold. Uh, and, um, well, I, had to find, I think she had to climb six flights to get to it, but she wrote a poem about how happy she was there. So for her, it was, it was great. And uh, she had decided she wasn't going to have a love relationship after that. Uh, but then uh, a Polish physicist who knew her, ironically, from her time as a governess, um, was now in Paris and, and knew Pierre Curie. And she was trying to work on her doctoral thesis and didn't have a space to, to do it in. So he thought that Pierre Curie, who, who wasn't at the Sorbonne, wasn't at the elite school, he was at the Ecole de Physique et Chimie, which was more of an engineering school. Anyway, <coughs> he had a lab. And this Polish physicist thought he might have lab space. He may also have thought that there might be a romantic connection. Um, but neither of them was interested. Pierre had forsworn, forsworn love forever. Um, I'm not sure exactly why. Uh, but anyway, um, he had them over. And she was immediately attracted. And she wrote that he was slow and deliberate in speech and he had a smile that was at once grave and youthful. Um, and she wrote to a friend in Poland, a surprising kinship developed between them. And she felt torn, she felt disloyal to Poland. Bronia had gone back and founded a TB sanatorium, um, very much, of course, connected to her mother's TB and so on, a beautiful TB sanatorium in the south of, of Poland, Zakopane. But, and she had every intention of going back and teaching and, you know, carrying on in the Polish cause. And uh, she explained to her a friend, she said she, she, was in, she felt great sorrow about having to stay in Paris, but she said, what can I do? Fate has made us deeply attached to each other and we cannot endure the idea of separating. So at that moment, a, a great love and a great partnership was, was born. And as I said, I'm going to leave it to others to talk about the science, but I just want to say that it, it was a tremendous scientific partnership, too, because Pierre had developed these very delicate measuring instruments, which were absolutely critical to Marie's discovering that 
the, uh, radioactivity, measuring pitch blend and these other elements and discovering that they were losing weight. And that was um, definitely, Pierre's contribution was really, was really important. Um, the first discovery was a polonium, which they named polonium after Poland, of course. The second was radium. And the more important discovery, um, which they early on realized, was the discovery of, of not of the elements themselves, but of radioactivity, of the phenomenon of radioactivity. Uh, at first, the discoveries had to be reported to the Academy by, by colleagues, because Pierre wasn't even a member of the Academy uh, at that point. Um, but in 1903, the discoveries caught the attention of the Swedish Academy, and um, they were um, offered the Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry, along with Henri Becquerel. Um, they, well, I have to go back. Now, the they that were offered was Pierre Curie and Henri Becquerel, and not Marie Curie. So in the beginning, the, the French scientists who actually proposed this, and some of them had worked with Marie Curie, one had been her kind of advisor, didn't think to include her in the nomination. But fortunately, there was one, uh, one Swedish scientist who was, who was her advocate, and that was Gustav Miktak Leffler. But the other person who was her advocate was Pierre. And he wrote, uh, if I'm going to receive the Nobel Prize, you must include Marie. He said, quote, wouldn't it be more satisfactory from an artistic point of view to have us both? <laughs> um, so the three of them won the Nobel Prize in physics in 19, uh, chemistry in 1903, and it created a sensation in France. It was romance in a laboratory headlines everywhere, and all these stories about them, endless stories about them, many of them made up. They, they interviewed their cat, you know, and they interviewed every, every Tom, Dick, and Harry. And, and uh, Marie and Pierre were miserable about it because they had they'd lost their privacy. And, uh, it did definitely put the Nobel Prize on the map. It, it was the one event that really made the Nobel Prize what it became and what it is now. Uh, so then, within three years, um, tragedy struck. Um, Pierre Curie uh, was walking on a rainy day. He was walking actually to the Institute um, and he had some work to do there, and uh, there was heavy traffic. He was preoccupied. He was often preoccupied. Um, he stepped in front of a, a wagon led by horses, and, and the horses, he tried to push against the horses. He fell down, and the back wheel of the wagon ran over his skull, and he was killed instantly. Um, Maurice Grief was enormous and it, 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 it took the form, among other things, that w her way of comforting herself was to continue to write to him. And so her diary entries are all about Pierre and you're not being there and the flowers were there and you weren't there and her regrets about the last words she said to him as he went off, that he didn't, she didn't say, I love you. Um, they're very, very moving letters. Um, to him. Uh, and there is a picture of her from that period, which is, uh, she looks so depressed. And the children who were there with her look so sad. Uh, and her, Pierre's brother Jacques, who was a wonderful man, wrote to her and said, really, Marie, you must, you know, get hold of yourself. You know, you think it's only for the children, nothing else. So then what happened was that Pierre's best friend in the world was, was Paul Langevin. And uh, he was an sci important scientist in his own right. Um, how am I doing on time? I'm okay. okay, two minutes? Okay, all right. So we're gonna go back now to the story I began with. What happened was that Marie Curie had an affair with Paul Langevin. Um, he, and it, it was so natural because Paul Langevin was very unhappy in his marriage and um, he confided in Marie. And Marie confided in him about Pierre and about her loss. And um, they wound up taking a little apartment in Paris. 
together and exchanging love letters, which Paul Langevin's wife got hold of, went to the papers, created a huge scandal, and it was a vicious uh, attack by a right-wing press that is very familiar to us right now. It, it's so similar, uh, com all kinds of lies and distortions. There were a bunch of duels fought, believe it or not, including one between Paul Langevin and the publisher of the letters. Nobody died, uh, but uh, the, 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 uh, this, the cost to Marie Curie was enormous. And around this, not long after this all happened, in 1911, the Nobel Committee decided they wanted to give Marie Curie a second Nobel Prize this time in physics. And um, at the last minute, she got a letter from them saying, we would like you to put off coming to accept the Nobel Prize because we think it would embarrass the king if he has to hand you the Nobel Prize, given what's happened with the scandal in France. This is the part of the story that Eve never wrote about. So, so uh, when I saw Eve in the audience that night and I was planning to talk about this, my husband happened to be there, fortunately. I went to him and I said, what should I do? I, you know, I, I have this whole talk plan and I know, you know, this is probably gonna, she's not gonna be happy with it. He said, go ahead and give the talk you were gonna give. It, it turned out in the end that she came up to me afterwards and said, I like what you said, which was a tremendous, really, really, really happy moment for me. Um, I'll just say one last thing about the effect of the, uh, uh, of the scandal and the aftermath, I think that it caused Marie to, as she said at the time when she was attacked, she was attacked as, as being a foreign woman, a, a Pole who should go back to where she came from, a lot of xenophobia. She responded, I am French, Pierre is French, my children, my daughters are French. And she felt that, she felt very Polish, but also she felt French. And she was deeply wounded by this. So when World War I came along, she, made this amazing contribution of the x-ray mobiles, which she really invented, put together a car that go right to the front and x-ray soldiers right at the front. And it was a tremendous life-saving idea. Which was multiplied, and she and her daughter Irene did them together. So I think that was a result, part of the scandal in the aftermath that, that she chose to do that. When she died in 1934, Many people believed and still do that uh, her uh, illness was caused mostly by her work in the lab with radium. But um, some people have looked at this closely. The exposure to x rays during World War I may have been more damaging than actually the lab, the exposure in the lab. So, in the end, it all came together in a certain way. Uh, and I think I should end there because uh, my time is up, but I'm happy to ask, uh, answer other questions afterward. That story is worth telling every time. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, and the special resonances to our time. So the calumnies uh, may not come as quickly in those days, but their effect was similar psychologically as it is on people who are subjected to vilification in the, in, through various social media. Uh, Maria, maybe you could tell us your story now. Sure. Well, uh, it's, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Kosciuszko Foundation and uh, the organizers. I think it is a great idea. To, to remind again and again and again how, how great, unusual, special was Maria Skłodowska Curie. As a scientist and a physician, surgeon, I'm, I'm very um, encouraged uh, to go back uh, to books which over, over years uh, have been uh, written as well as to the movies uh, which we have recently seen just just kind of to believe that what she did uh, really uh, happened because it's it's almost amazing uh, how many achievements she has and for a moment um, i will share a screen uh, uh, to summarize something which everybody knows but i will do it on a couple slides to show that somebody's life uh, have uh, so many unbelievable achievements 
and uh, I will uh, just um, show uh, this uh, story. So, uh, I would like uh, just uh, to uh, start uh, with. Uh, uh, can move? Okay. Uh, to the next slide. Uh, Mm, uh, to talk a little bit about Marie Curie as, as the scientist. Uh, and again, this is a this is very uh, short impression, but uh, summarized here is just showing that she was not only a genius, but also a real champion. Since for the past 86 years, since her death, nobody was able to duplicate her monumental achievements of being diverse in so many aspects of science and life. So just to present few, Marie Curie was the first woman ever to be awarded Nobel Prize in 93, the first woman ever to be awarded two Nobel Prizes, 1903 and 1911, first and the only woman until today to receive Nobel Prize in two different fields of science, physics, and chemistry. She also was the first female ever to become a professor at the University of Paris in 1906. Some people call um, the University Sorbonne. There is a little bit of uh, uh, misinformation. However, definitely there was the University of Paris. And uh, finally, uh, what is also um, amazing, that she was the first woman honored to, lay on, to rest in the Pantheon in Paris in 1995 on her own merit. Because there was uh, before, in 1907, a wife of a very well-known French scientist, and uh, she was also laid in Pantheon, but she was, uh, she was not on her own merit. So just these five uh, first achievements uh, in a relatively short life uh, of uh, Marie Curie, specifically from age of 24 when she came to France up to the time when, when unfortunately she died, uh, that's uh, totally amazing. Then uh, we can uh, also um, see that um, important uh, part of Marie life was Marie Curie as the mother. And uh, Marie Curie as the mother was um, inspiring, uh, of course, her daughter, um, who was Irene, who was working with her and who was uh, just uh, from the very young age uh, devoted uh, both to the mother and to the science, but also she inspired her, um, her uh, son-in-law, so, uh, who received also a Nobel Prize uh, with um, Irene in 1939. So they, um, Joliot, uh, discovered the first ever artificially created uh, radioactive atoms. There was another daughter, um, Irene, and um, Marie Curie's mother here was very proud of her but she went a totally different route, uh, no science. Uh, however, uh, she was a very accomplished French and American writer, journalist and pianist. And also what was interesting, she always joked that uh, there are five Nobel Prize winners in one family. And she is the only one uh, who was uh, not uh, successful but her husband was a Nobel Prize uh, a winner as well. So her uh, mother, her father, her sister, her <clears throat> brother-in-law, and uh, her husband were all receiving Nobel Prize. So this is telling us uh, about the science that uh, generally you can actually infect someone with, with scientific approach. You can, you can uh, just uh, spread this kind of fantastic uh, um, ability to, uh, to be attached to science. And uh, uh, for that reason, I think uh, this is another great accomplishment of, of Marie. Also, um, I would like just to uh, share something which is uh, personal, 
but I, I have a great privilege and, and was invited uh, to unveil a Marie Curie uh, sculpture in Polish uh, garden, uh, cultural garden in uh, Cleveland, uh, Ohio. And uh, the privilege was because I also have this, this um, amazing opportunity to dedicate and commemorate uh, my mother, Zofia Kusza, uh, who was um, in her involvement in the underground uh, known as a Szare Szeregi, uh, was a very brave uh, woman uh, with, with many contributions. So I would uh, now probably um, stop uh, here uh, just uh, uh, to, uh, to talk about uh, other uh, accomplishments uh, of Marie, um, but uh, some of them were totally um, not uh, predicted. Uh, there was something which was haunting Marie and is haunting all of us as a scientist today. And this is a lack of funding for our fantastic research. And I'm sure there would be many more scientists if there would be opportunity uh, to um, get funding for, for the research. And what was very interesting, and I think uh, um, very, very uh, unusual, was the fact that uh, uh, the major funding which Marie Curie received was raised by women of America. When Marie Curie came in 1921 uh, to the United States for the first time, she was very shy and she, uh, she was not really interested in, in uh, getting uh, a, a lot of press and media coverage. But uh, when she heard that there is a chance that for one gram of radium, she can get 100,000 US dollars, which was a lot of money at that time, to support um, her laboratory in Marie Curie Institute, uh, she, she came to the United States with both her daughters, Irene and Eve, and um, uh, she was uh, actually so very happy that um, uh, the United States or um, women of America supported uh, her fight for funding, which French government never supported, uh, which was really uh, unbelievable. And uh, to came back to come back to what uh, Susan uh, Quinn said about uh, um, you know bad press and bad media, uh, which she encountered after. Uh, the affair, it have reversed when she received uh, this hundred thousand dollars from the United States. All of a sudden, uh, French government and French media and French press again brought her up and was uh, just uh, talking about how great contributions Marie Curie was having, how fantastic she was, what a French woman she was. So. So I will uh, probably just stop here. I have uh, a long list of um, the best uh, uh, features of Marie as, as a woman, but we can discuss it uh, between us and with the audience. But uh, she was feminine, but she was independent. She was also a woman of uh, uh, total, um, ability uh, to just do what she wanted. She was not listening when she was convinced that her research and, and, and her life uh, is devoted uh, uh, to, to what uh, she was perseverant uh, in, in all her achievements. So, so I think uh, that's something from the perspective of, of, uh, of many women, I hope, uh, uh, as myself today, uh, both uh, having achievements, of course, not of this class, but trying to go through an um, ability to continue to do research, uh, to fight for funding, and, uh, and uh, really never will be able to achieve what Mary has uh, achieved in her life. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for uh, reminding us of uh, her role as mother um, in 
a family which was remarkably successful. Uh, people will have to go elsewhere to find out what you are doing, uh, but they will, uh, if, and they should, uh, because that's also a remarkable story, uh, Maria's story. And it's also a Polish and American story in its combinations. Now, we're going to hear now something which I suspect most of us had no idea about, which is a, uh, but which also gives a light, as you will see, on the atmosphere that Marie Curie established in her laboratories. And this is the story of, um, um, of Marie Curie and also of her daughter uh, and son-in-law and their Japanese co-workers. Keiko Kawashima, please tell us that story. Thank you. Okay. Good morning to everyone. So it's morning, morning in Japan. I'm Keiko Kawashima from Nagoya Institute of Technology. Today, I'd like to tell you about a Japanese uh, fortunate studied and a scientist from the Curie family. This Japanese are likely unknown neither in the United States nor Poland. On the arrives and careers show you what value Marie Curie had for Japan in the first part of the 20th century. The two men on the left were Marie Curie's student and studied polonium and thorium at the Radio Institute in Paris. The woman on the right is Frederick Jorio Curie's student. She studies a beta spectrum of artificial radio element. For example, vanadium-52 at the laboratory for nuclear chemistry in College de France. The relationship between the three and the Curie family scientists is shown in the next slide. And this is the period of their study in Paris. So you ask her two times. This shows that Yamada collaborated with Ihan also and Onoda with Frederick Julio. Yuasa initially intended to work at the Radium Institute, to which Ehren belongs. However, because of the World War II, she could not achieve her first intention due to the rules of the army. So she studied under Frederick. Yet, one of the reviewers of Yuasa's PhD dissertation was Ehren. And when Yuasa returned to France after the war, she also collaborated with um, Ellen, the Jorio Curie's daughter. So USA had a close relationship with this family. The three Japanese, especially USA, longed to work for Marie Curie since they were in Japan. How Marie was now in Japan in the 1920s and 1930s. Probably, an interesting our example of the attention to Marie Curie in Japan is the numerous articles appeared in Mukudori Tsushin, the column that introduced Western culture in a mainstream magazine, Subaru. The author was Oga Mori, a famous writer and medical doctor who studied in Germany. From 1910 to 1912, Ogai reported that Curie had refined metric radium with André de Vierne, won the Nobel Prize for the second time, and the Academy of Sciences rejected her membership, and so on. These topics were reported in almost real time. Amazing. It seems that Marie Curie was widely known in Japan, in Japan after World War I. In 1937, 37, when the Japanese translation, it's a Japanese translation of Madame Curie by Eve Curie was planned, Marie Curie was already a well-known public figure in Japan. I think there are four reasons. First, the Japanese translation in published in 1938, the same year as the publication in France. Second, the four Japanese translators, there are four Japanese, four translators. They are the old reading and promising French literary figures at that time. Third, the translators described in the book 
that Marie Curie was known even to Japanese elementary school students. Fourth, the biography, this biography, quickly became a bestseller and ranked among the books widely read by normal school students, future school teachers. It was welcomed as a woman's career story, which has not existed in Japan yet. Marie Curie has had gender characteristics that were universally acceptable. As we had also, she was a wife and mother. We should remember the famous speech of Warren Harding, the 29th president of the United States. According to Eve's biography, when Marie visited the country for the first time in 1921, the president addressed himself cordially to uh, the noble creature, the devoted wife and loving mother, who, who aside from her crushing toil, had fulfilled all the duties of womanhood. He said read this. Moreover, she preferred a simple way of life. She detested luxury. It was easy to present a saintly image of her. It is an ideal female image. This aspect was also welcomed in Japan, and the simple lifestyle appealed to Japanese sensibility. Marie Curie was prayed, especially by school teachers. Marie Curie's fame in Japan. First, in Japan, as Marie Curie became famous after World War I, that is, it is after Pierre's death. She was not viewed as a husband assistant, unlike in France. In Japan, she was always seen as an independent scientist. The second, Marie Curie was a good example of studying how will lead to social success. It is an ideal model for modern Japan. Another feature of Marie Curie's fame in Japan is modern Japan has an affinity with Marie Curie, she is Polish in origin and a passionate patriot who wanted Poland independence. And she studied hard and succeeded. She became the glory of Poland. This story moved Japanese so much because they, Japanese, forced to open the country in the 19th century, were always afraid of being a colony of Western big countries. In fact, the surrounding Asian countries were already colonized. At the time, Japan put its goal to catch up with and overtake the Western powers. Marie Curie's devotion to Poland seems great to both men and women in Japan. For example, a translator wrote like this, pure academic quest, service to the motherland, and the desire to promote the welfare of mankind, these are in perfect harmony as the trinity in Madame Curie. It is an example of self-completion by self-sacrifice, vividly demonstrating the beauty of her life. What is important here for Japanese is service to the motherland and self-completion by self-sacrifice. I think naturally, the previously mentioned three Japanese scholars who came to work in France also had such an image of Mary. Nobu Yamada, though he died unfortunately due to radiation injury, is 31 years old. He is a typical example of career first through education. He, a descendant of farmers in the Edo period, who had no freedom of moving a choice of profession. Thanks to, to Power Browning, became a professor at Tokyo Imperial University, Japan's top university. It is actually a career development case unique to modern times. By the way, he's the first Japanese male scientist to have a female teacher and female colleagues. Tadashi Onoda, is an example of a man who succeeded as an engineer and entrepreneur through science and technology. With his European mentors connections, he had worked with the Curies and Max Bodenstein. 
he visited factories in Europe, and through uh, these factory tours, he gained knowledge about die casting. He established a company in Japan and improved the science and technology of the field in Japan. But Toshiko Yuasa, unlike them, is a symbol of attention, question of women and science in modern Japan. Yuasa's life is one answer to the question of what happens if a woman chooses physics, a non feminine field in science? Comparing the three, we note that very few universities allowed girls to enroll before the war. The two men often moved to a new place to study, and eventually both earned a bachelor's degree from Tohoku North Imperial University. On the other hand, Yuasa was forced to go to a school that she could commute from her home in Tokyo, Tokyo Bunrika University. That is, she could not enroll in Tokyo Imperial University, Japan's top university, which did not accept female students. Even in the doctoral degree, the two men got a PhD at Tokyo Imperial University, but Yuasa got a PhD in France. Regarding study abroad expensive, Japanese government paid or guaranteed for the two men to study abroad, but USA was a scholarship student of French government. In pro Japan, even in the science, Japan only paid for women who were subject to a feminine, feminine field, for example, such as gynecology, hygiene, nutrition, etc., to study abroad. However, as USA was not supported by Japan, she got a kind of freedom. Who decided on, oh, excuse me, who decided on France and the Radium Institute in the three cases? As for two men, it was not themselves, but it was their teacher or their school. In contrast to their cases, USA moved by a Gioria Curie's article on artificial radioactivity made the decision to go to France for herself. Of course, such freedom was not unrelated with her isolation in Japan. In fact, uh, the careers of these scientists after they returned to Japan were also different. The two men attained high level position in Japan without any obstacles. However, a similar road could not be open to USA in Japan. Eventually, she relied on Frederick Joriot to return to France and end her life in Paris as a researcher at the French National Center for Scientific Research. Yuasa is the Japanese first female physicist and the first Japanese contributor to the brain drain after World War II. It is French money and French culture that cultivated the nuclear scientist Toshiko Yuasa. Due to these career differences, USA, who did not know Marie Curie directly, became the scientist most influenced by the Curie family spirit, like this. She took note of Frederick Joliot's words as, in the laboratory, there is no hierarchy. Everyone is part of one family. When someone wants to do research in a certain direction, no one can prevent him or her from doing it, not even the director. USA herself described it as in this laboratory, that is in his laboratory, uh, the research itself grows like living thing. And gender and nationality didn't matter here. This is, I think, just a wonderful tribute to Marie Curie's laboratory tradition, in which in Radium Institute, when she was director, a considerable number of women and foreigners work not as simple assistants, but as equal members. Toshiko USA has been called a Japanese Madame Curie and became a role model for Japanese women aiming for science. Since 2013, her alma mater, Ochanomizu University, has offered the Toshiko USA Memorial Scholarship Fund for special researchers. 
in memory of her contribution to science and French-Japanese relations, and to encourage international activities of young female scientists today. This is an example that the spirit of Marie Curie had been passed down to Japan, I think. It's a good example. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. And uh, that was, I think, news to, to most of us. We just didn't know about these people and their career paths. Um, and there, there is much more in Keiko's writing. In, in, there is a very interesting story of, of Yaesu uh, working as a Japanese na national an ally of the Germans during World War II in the laboratory of Joliot Curie, which was active in that period, even though they were active in the resistance. And then Yaesu gets caught at the end of World War II as an, in a sense, enemy alien in Paris and has to get back to Japan which Keiko tells her story. It's a very interesting one. It involves taking a, a, a railroad through Siberia at one point. Um, so the geopolitics gets mixed up in all of these stories. So we have heard uh, several now stories, familiar and unfamiliar and interesting in their reflection on Marie Curie's life. Uh, what was mentioned uh, somewhere along the way is it is the hundredth anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution when the last state signified its uh, assent. And that uh, that uh, amendment, uh, it, it, it forbade the states to make any regulations to prevent women from voting. Uh, women um, could not vote in a number of European countries till substantially later than that time. Uh, it is interesting to reflect in view of the great successes of Marie Curie on uh, what, has, what has changed. What has clearly not changed is that she remains an aspirational motivation for every young woman in the world who wants to become a scientist. But but also for young men like me in Germany. That's what I said at the outfit. Uh, but this story is unique and it's aspirational. But with respect to the realities of the situation for women in science, what can we say? I wonder if some of you uh, would like to reflect on has anything changed since Marie Curie's time? Maria, maybe you have something. Sure. Um, well, I would say that uh, one thing which has not changed is uh, that women who are um, strong-willed will get where they are planning to go. And they don't look at the obstacles. Uh, they are um, actually carrying uh, the ideas in which they believe. And uh, as much as they can get uh, funding or support is the most important part is never give up. And I think that's um, very true about all women in science, but also about Marie with all the obstacles of funding, of, of getting, uh, uh, the role for um, just uh, production or of of the uh, of the uranium uh, getting from Austrian government uh, 
some some special prizes for the fact that then uh, she was uh, she was able to um, continue her research. Uh, we have seen uh, both in the books as well as in the movies that the laboratories were not so highly tech equipped. Uh, many things were just done manually, and you know. Honestly, nowadays, of course, we have MRIs, we have CT scans, we have all these fantastic machines, but when it comes to the lab, it's your hands, your brain, and yourself who is moving things forward. And I think this has not changed. Um, Susan, you, you well, have also just... worked on a biography of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. And yes. friend. So when I think of an inspirational woman, for my age, Eleanor Roosevelt was it uh, also. But very different, but, uh, but also got things done in her way. She did. She did. Um, she was a much more sort of out there fighting, you know, in a way that Marie, well, Marie did that too. But I just would... Uh, point out that, that Marie dealt with a lot of rejection as well as success. Uh, for instance, she, in 1911, she was nominated to belong to the, to join the Academy of Science and that, and was rejected. And it took another 51 years for the French Academy to accept a woman. And that woman was someone, and this is a positive part of it, a, a Mar Mar Marguerite Perret from Marie Curie's lab, who discovered Frankium and she was the first woman to be admitted to the Academy of Science um, as a scientist, as a, not a physician. So, you know, there were, there were some, Marie was very determined and often very successful, but she also faced numerous rejections. Um, and, uh, and I think that still happens. Yes. And you, as you were pointing out, Dr. Hoffman, there's not a single woman chemist in the Polish Academy, which is surprising. Yes, that is surprising. Um, not as a full member, there is a corresponding member. But, um, I think there has been an idea, and perhaps there's some truth to it, that Marie Curie was so successful that it's daunting for other people, <laughs> that she's kind of out there in some stratosphere it's hard for others to emulate. I think that's not so true now. Um, in, I, interestingly, I went to the dermatologist today and had some stuff done and she told me that um, Marie Curie had been her inspiration. And uh, so I think it's not just in science, you know, it, 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 it's, it, in fact, she was my inspiration and I wound up being a, a writer. Yes. So um, she was inspiring to many of us. Yes. But maybe I will just comment that uh, the uh, academies or institutions which are not, which are rejecting uh, uh, mm -hmm. such an in individual uh, people like Marie Curie are just, um, I would say, giving a question mark on um, the fairness of the, of the process of understanding of accomplishments, of understanding of, of science and also of understanding that uh, this person is actually above maybe everybody in this society, however, should be recognized for, for that. So, so I'm, I'm actually looking into, sceptically into this situation that, uh, as Professor Hoffman said, that the, in Polish Academy of Science, the, the, the woman, uh, there is no woman, uh, in between 80 um, more um, participants. And I would say that that's today, we are in 21st century and have not changed. So sometimes maybe uh, people just don't deserve that people of Curie uh, caliber will be a part of, of the institutions which, which are not mature enough to accept them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a question about the Polish Academy of Chemistry, okay? I, I want to know how to choose the member. 
oh, it's Keiko, it's like all, uh, all academies. It looks like the main reason for their existence is to choose members. Yes, because uh, uh, art for the Academy of Science in, in, at Paris, the selection, uh, how to say, the selection way is changed. At the, at the time of Marie Curie or Irene Jolie Curie, we should be candidate and we should fail a campaign uh, themselves. But uh, now it changed. So there, there is some, some female scientists. Look, I think, uh, I think it's important the, the selection, select, selectical way or selection way, how to select or who the vote or uh, it depends on the women's right to. Yes. Well, in Marie Curie's time, you had to mount a campaign, and you had to get all kinds of allies to vote for you, and it was, a, it was you know, it's very political. That that may have changed. I don't know. Yes, you you are uh, uh, Rod. You are your female student. Are uh, got. Uh, yes, Odile Eisenstein. Odile, Odile, Odile says, said to me the selection way is changed. Now yeah. we should not be candidate. Academy selected some. Yes, that's right. Uh, they have a selection procedure that is a, a little uh, more rational, but these still these things remain still quite arcane and encumbered by uh, long processes. Uh, but there is no question in the United States, at least, that the number of women in science has increased in recent times. It's a phenomenon of the last 25 years. And now I know in chemistry, the numbers, the number of PhDs hovered between 10 and 15% for almost a century. And then now it has uh, shot up to, to 35 to 39% at the PhD level. At uh, for professor appointment level, the, there is still a problem. Uh, it, the, the, there seem to be barriers to advancing in the profession, but in terms of entering the profession at the highest level, at the PhD, uh, this has now become accessible. So it is only a question of time. And on hiring, we can see uh, positive movement to, uh, to introduce more women into science departments in general. In science departments where they were, the more biological you get, the more women there have been uh, traditionally. But now uh, we're talking about the physical sciences and mathematics. Role models matter. Um, now I have... Uh... Let me add something to the discussion because every year the Kosciuszko Foundation runs interviews for scholarships for Polish, young Polish scholars like those who are on PhD track or PhD scholars to, and we invite them to the United States. So we have seen an increase in, uh, in science that there are more and more uh, female scholars, so that's very optimistic. I just checked the numbers for the last year. 40% were female students in science category. So that's something optimistic, it's something promising. It's a kind of promising message. Uh, that is promising. I got a question on the questions and answers. Let me introduce it um, because uh, I will read the question because it'll also open up the possibility for other people who are uh, in the webinar to ask questions. I know that the people who are seeing us on YouTube are, don't have that possibility. But what I have is a message from Hanna Markovsky who writes, the academic system, especially in the sciences, doesn't always support female graduate students having children during their time as graduate students. And, or, and say a postdoc is a great time to have a child. 
what are your recommendations for academic systems to support diversity in personal life planning for graduate students while also getting the science done, in quotation marks. Uh, yes, it's a natural time to start a family. And, and, and how to combine that with building a career. Are there any feelings about that? I maybe will inject that it's always to have an um, option of family member support. Is it uh, a husband? Is it uh, a mother? Is it, uh, you know, parents-in-law? Um, that's something which definitely helps, at least knowing that there will be support. Uh, many uh, women in science uh, are actually working to the very last day before delivery and they are going uh, to the <laughs> emergency room or to the delivery room uh, just uh, from work, uh, which means that actually they can uh, achieve that and, and, and there is no problem. Of course, I understand uh, uh, the, the question that um, I remember back in Poland, actually, uh, when uh, I was applying for, for the hand surgery position as, as a woman, uh, young at that time, uh, the first question, which will be never asked uh, now and here, was, are you planning a, a, a children? I was already married, you know. Uh, so, so this this question will <laughs> be never asked in, uh, today for 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 the harassment reasons and so on. But it was straightforward to check, uh, and it's natural that if if the woman is young and it's married uh, or even not and maybe planning uh, having children, uh, so so I would only think that the best way is is just to organize it on on your own. And, and then see who will be a supporter, so who is the family member who can help, and, and just carry on for both, <laughs> to have a children and science. I did a, a, a small anecdote about Marie and Pierre Curie came to mind. He, he, he was very involved in, um, in the early days with planning for the first baby. And there's some charming letters that he wrote to Marie who was off, she was actually up in the north of France vacationing and he was in Paris and he was buying um, little undershirts for the baby who hadn't been born yet. And he was asking her about what size he should get. Uh -huh. um, he, it's yet another example of the way which Pierre supported Marie. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't around so long, but in the beginning he was there. Yes. Um, yeah, I think, are there any other questions that people would like to hear discussed, talked about, that we can tell you? Um, I think Marie Curie, what I can say, I think she has en enriched our lives just her her being there and what she has accomplished and it's very good maria that you put those firsts up there uh, i think these are together with the life that susan has told in especially the beginnings of the sisters taking uh, turns and of the schools that they began these are all such encouraging things. We can, we can find parallels. And there is a way through for any woman, any man to reach to absolutely every level. And then having reached that level to establish in a laboratory a um, feeling for people in science, as that quotation that Keiko has given showed. Th those, are, those seem like small things, but not every laboratory had that. And there was something special. I think that uh, Marie Curie brought 
to France, to Poland, and to her family, and to the world. So I think with that, perhaps I will close our discussion and thank all the participants for sharing in this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.